Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webcast from the OSLC Community Series, Introduction to and Demonstration of the W3C Community Group Tools. This webcast is being recorded. If you have a problem with that, please leave now. If you are connected via the telephone, please go ahead and mute yourself, either using your phone or by pressing star six. Today's web webcast is presented by Ian Jacobs, who is the head of marketing and communications for W3C. He's going to be showing us all about the wonderful tools available for community groups, which is a new initiative of the W3C that lets anyone come and do specification development or other collaborative work using some excellent tools. I'm going to be uh, passing control to to Ian, and he will lead us through a wonderful series of uh, demonstrations of how to use the tools, how to get started using the tools. And uh, if you have questions, you can raise your hand. I will be monitoring that and, and uh, um, we'll uh, try and cut in and make an opportunity for you to speak if you like, or you can go ahead and chat uh, using the tools available in the video conference. Ian, thank you very much for doing this, and it's all yours. Thank you, Sean, and thank you for inviting me to uh, talk about community groups today. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, I want to cover a certain number of topics uh, today about getting involved in community groups, and uh, you should feel free to ask questions. Uh, I'll pause from time to time, but um, if it's really uh, super important, feel free to, to raise your hand. So I will give a quick overview of community groups and why we created them, and then talk about uh, how people participate, uh, which involves getting an account, proposing groups, joining groups, and then what the groups uh, have available as infrastructure for doing collaborative work. So why don't we jump right in, <coughs> sharing um, my uh, browser screen today and also a chat channel screen in just a moment. So this is the home page for W3C community and business groups. And uh, the, the point of the home page is to give people uh, both a sense of uh, the, the program as a whole and also the latest news. So um, we have here uh, the list of current groups, uh, the ones that were most recently created. Uh, there were several created over the last few days, you can see. And then a list of proposed groups. We'll explain what that means in a moment. And then um, if you keep scrolling down, you'll see that we have a, a news section. So it turns out that uh, this news is an aggregation of news from all the in individual groups as well as sort of system announcements. So we have, I think, the top 10 most recent items on the, on the home page. So the home page of community groups is really for, you know, what's going on. Uh, we, have some, we have a feed you can track the latest um, news from community groups as well. So uh, that's the home page. So what are community groups? As you can see from the intro on this page, um, we, create, we created community groups uh, as sort of a lightweight way for people to come to W3C to do work. We have a, our sort of traditional standards track uh, with a set of policies and processes associated with it, and we've produced a lot of standards uh, using those policies and processes, uh, but we perceived a demand for people to be able to get together and uh, do work, start groups very quickly, have broader participation, and so to uh, basically grow the W3C community and make it easier for people to participate, we created community groups and business groups. Now, my focus today is going to be on community groups, and I'm going to click on the About button to, to read about some of the benefits and characteristics of community groups. Um, business groups, uh, I may say a little bit about at the end, they're like community groups, but they have some additional features, and uh, uh, people who want to create a business group have um, have, uh, if, if they're not W3C members, there are fees associated with participating, and in exchange for those fees, they get some of those additional benefits. So I won't focus on them today, but rather community groups. Um, as you can see in this list of characteristics, uh, anyone can participate in a community group. 
there's no charge for participating in a community group. They're very quick to start. In fact, they can be started in a matter of minutes. Um, all the communications are publicly visible. The group is self-determined, meaning uh, other than the very lightweight process and policy framework we've set up, uh, they come up with their own internal rules for governing things like decision making um, and uh, other internal processes. Um, they can continue for as long as they're uh, active. Um, that's a difference from existing W3C groups, which we charter for a, for a set amount of time. Um, these groups, because we're talking about community building, can go on as long as the community is sort of actively engaging. Uh, we have a lightweight IPR policy designed so that people can join groups quickly without uh, a heavyweight licensing commitment. And uh, as their work matures, they can uh, increase the scope of their licensing commitment for the benefit of implementers. And we've designed them so that they do play well with the standards track. So uh, the policies themselves, for example, are designed so that work transitions easily uh, to the recommendation track if the community uh, decides that that is how they want to proceed. So there are more uh, links to useful information from this About page. Uh, we have a FAQ that's growing, uh, a number of policy documents here. Um, and uh, but let me go back to the current groups page. So right now we have, uh, as of today, 54 groups uh, that have been created. On this page, you can learn a little bit about what each group does. This is the, the descriptive blurb for the augmented reality community group. And um, there's a, a, a list of proposed groups as well linked from the top. So the, the way the system works is that uh, people uh, start a group by proposing it, uh, one, which we'll look at in a moment. And then when there's sufficient support from the community, it pops into existence and gets infrastructure and becomes a current group. And we'll look at the infrastructure in a little while as well. So let me pause there and see if there are any questions about uh, why we've created groups. And uh, if not, I will proceed. So uh, the, the way you start to participate in community groups is you need an account. So at the top of the page here, there's a link that says, get an account. Uh, if you don't have one, uh, it's pretty easy to do. You put in your given name or your first name and family name or last name, an email address. And uh, the only part that's tricky here is your affiliation. So the reason we ask for affiliation information has to do with the patent policy for participating in a community group. So. There are a couple of options here. If you work for a W3C member, then uh, you can uh, basically choose the name of the W3C member, say Adobe, just to pick one, or IBM, uh, from this list. And uh, your uh, organization will be involved in the creation of your account. If you work for an organization that is not a W3C member, uh, it also appears in this list in some cases. Or if it doesn't, then you can add a new organization, and you can provide the name of the organization and its address, and just a little bit of information so that we can um, identify it in the future. Uh, or if you really have no affiliation with any organization, you can select none, and then we really are only interested in your name and email. When you uh, submit this form, you'll get an email back uh, that includes a confirmation code to prevent spam. And you'll, you can follow that link and enter the confirmation code, and that will confirm your account. Uh, any, any questions on getting an account? We'll see more about the affiliation bits in just a moment, but um, it, 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 it's a basic mailback system. OK, so once you have an account, then uh, you can log in. And uh, uh, at that point, you can do things like update your account. I'm going to go ahead and log in under my account. And uh, you can do things like uh, uh, go to my account. And there's a reason that has to do with LDAP, while I'm pro why I'm prompted a second time. You can go to your uh, account and do things like uh, put, put your photo uh, 
uh, in your account, uh, update any contact information, and so on. Uh, the I will add as a note here, the W3C Systems team is doing an overhaul of the account system. Uh, right now, for example, if I look at the list of participants in, in a group, there's the photo for Marcos uh, that he added. Uh, but if I click on this, I don't go anywhere. But we are adding user profiles to the system. Um, so I look forward to that as a new feature in the course of a few months. Um, so now I, now I have my account, and I've logged in and <clears throat> uh, added my photo, for example. Uh, and with that, I can uh, start to engage with the community. So if I'm interested in starting a new group, um, this is, again, the, w, the community group homepage, I can uh, simply go to this big orange shiny button that says Start a Community Group. And, and um, to, to create one, uh, I propose a name. So for example, suppose I want to create the uh, new web uh, style group, uh, community group, community group. Um, and then I give it a description of a paragraph or so. And then a short name. The short name is um, is just a little symbolic name that we use in URLs and some other tools. And then I would push the propose a group button. So I'm not going to do that here, but but there's just those three bits of information to provide. And um, I can show you then what what it looks like once uh, once you have proposed the group, uh, and it shows up in our list of proposed groups. The the descriptive paragraph. Uh, is shown here, and shortly after you've proposed it, it shows up on the home page as a recently proposed group. So in the last two days, we've had a couple of proposed groups. There's the short description, and there's a button underneath it that says, uh, yes, create this community group. And this is where people in the community start to show their support for um, for creating this community group. So when we built the system, we decided we wanted to uh, empower the community to sort of make the determination about when it was okay to create a community group, and we might reduce some noise uh, by putting in the path of creating a group uh, five people saying, yes, we think this should be created. So when five individuals uh, push this button, uh, for example, for this other one, there's now a total of two people, including the person who originally proposed it, who have shown support for this group, and this one has four people. And when it gets to five, uh, I get a notice internally that says, there's sufficient support for this group. Uh, please do a quick check. <clears throat> and then I push a button, and the group moves to the created group list. So once a group exists and has been created, uh, every group gets a home page. So this is the very fresh home page of the Web of Sensors community group that was just created over the last day or so. And um, now that it exists, uh, people can start to join it. So the first point to just reinforce is that um, showing your support for the creation of a group <clears throat> involves no commitment. It's just sort of a uh, you know a little filter that we have set up. But uh, the next step is to actually join the group. So I'll show that in just a moment. Um, this group <clears throat> now exists. Uh, it has a home page. And uh, people can start to join it. In, in just a moment, we'll look at these tools that are available. Uh, but there's a big, bright Join This Group button. And now you can uh, select that in order to join the group. So <clears throat> if I click this button, I see a particular view of this joining page based on my account affiliation. This is where we're going to get into the account affiliation stuff in detail. Um, I'm on the W3C staff, and so uh, I, I would join by, by uh, agreeing to certain terms, but um, really the, the most of the community will see other things. So I, I'm going to show you some different views of what this page would look like uh, for different groups. I've created some static views uh, of the join page. Um, if you, uh, many of you may know that every uh, organization that's a W3C member has what's called an advisory committee representative representative who is the key uh, link between the organization and W3C. So in the land of community groups and in working groups generally at W3C, only the W3C advisory committee representative for a member can join the group. 
So if there are other employees uh, who are interested in joining, they see something else, but only the advisory committee representative uh, can, can join on behalf of the member. And to do so, this is what, this, uh, what someone would, would see. Uh, there's basically a, a click through, they check the box, and then they would uh, say, yes, I agree to the terms of the community uh, process and also the contributor license agreement uh, to participate in, uh, in this group. They would push the button and they would be in. If you're an advisory committee representative, then uh, once you've accepted the terms, you can then, you have another form that you're taken to to nominate various individuals to sort of represent your organization in the group, and advisory committee representatives know how to do that. Uh, so I won't go over that in detail. If you are an employee for an organization that's a W3C member and you're not the advisory committee representative, we, we have a slightly different behavior. We say uh, you can send an email automatically to your advisory committee representative who then gets a queue of requests to join uh, this group and other groups. So if you're a member employee that's not the AC rep, we have a convenient way for you to alert your advisory committee representative that you want to join this group, and then the advisory committee representative would do so. So, so that covers the two member cases. The next case is, is uh, if you're not a W3C member organization, then uh, and you are a person who wishes to join the group, there are two options. The first is you can request to join on behalf of your non-member organization, or you can request to join as an individual. So at the beginning I mentioned that participation has no, uh, there are no fees to participate, but all of the participants sign this contributor agreement uh, in order to uh, be in a community group. So I'm going to show you for a moment uh, if I go to the community group's homepage or any page in the about link. Uh, under policies here, you'll see that there's a process. The process basically sets up a very small number of rights and responsibilities for, for being in a group. Mostly it says here's how we create groups, close groups. Um, th there are some requirements for you know behaving well in the community, uh, some requirements related to publications, but it's a, it's a very lightweight process. Uh, and the, the, the main thing that people need to be aware of is this uh, contributor agreement. So this agreement was designed so that people can join uh, a community group that's developing a specification, and they sign this agreement that says they will license their contributions uh, under a permissive copyright and under a royalty-free uh, patent uh, license. Uh, which is uh, essentially that of the uh, W3C working groups, uh, for those who are familiar with that. And the, the, the reason this is lightweight is that your commitments are bound to your contributions. So if you're in a group and you're not contributing materially to the specification, you don't have any licensing commitments. So I, I won't go into the details of this agreement, though that's worth a whole, a whole call. Uh, but there is a summary here, patent and copyright policy summary, that explains sort of the goals of these policies, uh, sort of how the policy works, uh, the copyright and patent licensing terms, and uh, the various ways in which both patent holders and uh, implementers benefit from the balance that we've struck in, the, in this policy. So that is what people sign when they join. So we go back to the, to the, uh, to the advisory committee representative. That is what the advisory committee representative is signing on behalf of the member. That is what this person who is affiliated with a non-member organization is signing. So they can either sign on behalf of the non-member or they can request to join as an individual. So in general, W3C prefers uh, these licensing commitments from organizations because they provide a lot more protection for implementers. And so we go through a sort of manual negotiation where we look to see whether the organization in question that's a non-member uh, whether uh, they should join because that would be uh, best for the community, or if the person who's interested uh, has you know valid reasons for participating with just a personal commitment. So we we start to ask questions about if the individual owns uh, their own intellectual property and if the organization in question has material interest in the outcome of the work. So this is sort of the most complicated part of the system because we're trying to get the most patent policy coverage that we can uh, while at the same time trying to make it as easy to join as possible, and there's sort of a delicate balance in there. So we're still working on getting this exactly right. This is our first year of operations, and this is an area 
of focus for us. Uh, but that's the, the current state of the system. Um, I have one other view to show, uh, which is um, if you uh, have no affiliation, so if when you signed up for your account you said you have no affiliation, then uh, you can just join as an individual. That's straightforward. But um, for people who have existing accounts that were created before we launched community groups, um, we don't know enough about your affiliation yet, so there's uh, another form you may see that says, uh, we don't yet know if you're affiliated with your current account, and we're going to ask you information uh, about your affiliation, and this is done through an email exchange. So I show you this because uh, some people may see this, but if you're someone who's creating a new account, uh, you won't run into this. Um, so let me pause there. That, that's sort of the join operation. Uh, are there any questions? But I see that Scott has typed a question into the, the chat box. Okay. Um, Scott, I don't know if you want to just voice that here, or I can read that. Uh, yeah, I can read it out loud now that I found the chat box. OSLC has an option of a license grant or a patent covenant. Do I understand correctly that W3C does not offer a patent covenant option? So, Scott, maybe you can unmute to see if I understand. Um, if I understand correctly, the question is, um, this is a uh, license grant framework. Uh, OSLC has a non-assert option. Do we have that as well? Is that is that the question? I think I read patent covenant option to mean non-assert. So you can correct me if I'm wrong on that. And I'll read the I'll read the chat channel to see if uh, if that's the question. Yes, that's the right question. Okay, so um, we looked at both um, the license framework and the non-assert when we designed the policies, and, and it turned out that people mostly wanted. Uh, uh, tight integration with the existing W3C patent policy for working groups because it was well understood. And uh, so when we created the contributor agreement, we ended up, for example, adopting whole cloth the same terms uh, of, the, of the licensing uh, framework from the patent policy. So this section 12.8 essentially you know, copies uh, what was in the W3C patent policy, as and we copied the definition of essential claims. And so my understanding from discussions with the membership uh, was that they preferred sort of a consistent policy uh, rather than one that uh, went uh, was new and was an honest certain. So we did consider it, but we ended up going with the licensing framework. Having said that, um, there is this section 3.2 that says, in addition to the provisions uh, that have to do with the licensing framework, I may, at my option, make certain IPR uh, infringed by implementations available by providing uh, other terms. So I, I believe we, if my recollection is that uh, through 3.2, if you wanted to also uh, make available a non-assert, you could do that, and we would publish the terms on our site. So. Uh, we don't have an either or, but we, we for those who also want to make available an honest word, they can do that. Okay, so uh, I'll, any other questions? Uh, okay, so let's let's go ahead. I'm happy to take other uh, IPR policy questions, but um, there, there's a second. I, while we're in here, I should mention there's a second policy, uh, which we call the final specification agreement. And uh, I'll go to the summary for this view. The, the way the system is designed, in order to uh, make it lightweight for people to join, uh, we, we, we have a two-step policy, essentially. The first is uh, people sign a contributor, sign a contribu contributor agreement, uh, which covers uh, just their contribution. So in a given draft specification, you'll have a variety of different commitments over different portions of the specification. But you don't have coverage by all the participants over the entire specification. And we intend to cover that through a second uh, agreement called the final specification agreement. That is always voluntary. And essentially what we expect to happen is the group will work for a while, work on its specification until it's mature, 
and then issue what we call a call for final specification commitments, and then people will uh, voluntarily go sign this final specification agreement, and we'll maintain a database uh, on our site that shows which participants have signed that agreement and which haven't. Um, and so uh, that's how we sort of uh, addressed this goal of lightweight startup at the same time as wanting to provide uh, as much coverage as possible at the end of the process. So uh, this is different from the W3C uh, uh, working group patent policy, and uh, somewhere in here we have a, a comparative chart for the, or in the fact we have a comparison of the two policies for those who are interested. Um, one other comment I wanted to make about joining a group is that uh, once you are in a group uh, and you visit the join page, it turns into a leave page. Uh, so if you're an advisory committee representative and you visit the join page again, it'll invite you to, uh, you know, if you wish to leave the group, there's another checkbox, and uh, and then um, you are no longer uh, listed as being in the group, and your your obligations cease at that point. But you need to read the policies in detail to find out what what the obligations were and which ones uh, would persist over time. Let me go to show you what it looks like again in a particular. Group. This is the Accessible Infographics group. Uh, if we visit their homepage, um, we can see uh, this list of participants. This is what this one has 15 people in it, and uh, each person, as you can see, has their photo. And I mentioned earlier, over time, we'll have uh, those photos will link to user profiles. We don't have those in place yet. So, uh, so that is uh, how we show who has joined a group. Uh, once once a group is up and running, then um, let's talk a little bit about the infrastructure that they have available. If I, if I go to the About page, uh, we have a whole page on uh, tools and infrastructure. So this shows you uh, what groups get by default when we launch the group, uh, what groups can request but isn't provided by default, um, the, the uh, and, and some other uh, minimal documentation of, of uh, for example, the purpose for the mailing lists and how to use the blog. Um, we we have not fully documented all, all of the, uh, for example, how to use uh, WordPress, which is the blog we're using. We we hope that by using an open source tool, people can find uh, you know ample documentation of how to how to use the tool generally. Um, the the four tools uh, or four or five tools that we make available available uh, by default uh, are, are shown here in the left-hand uh, bar. So uh, the first thing is uh, each group gets several mailing lists. So we've had some questions. Why, why are there three mailing lists? It turns out that uh, one list is for um, the general community to be able to interact with the group. So because these groups conduct their work in public, People may have questions. They may want to review documents, send in suggestions for conversations, and so forth. Um, so that that connects the the group to the world. Uh, this one that ends with contrib is for helping the group track uh, contributions because contributions are so critical to the to the patent policy that we give the group a tool for managing and keeping track of contributions. Uh, so that one is writable only by participants in the group. This first one is writable by anyone. And then uh, we do provide an internal mailing list. Sometimes the group may have sensitive information. So say people want to exchange phone numbers to discuss something. And uh, so we provide a, an internal list uh, for them to, 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 but, uh, to use. But they're not intended. it's not intended for them to do work on that internal list. So. So those are the mailing lists available. W3C has a long history of managing mailing lists and efficient spam control on lists, so um, groups continue to ask for them. Uh, each group has a wiki. Uh, we use MediaWiki currently. This group has started to use their wiki uh, to create documents, um, and I believe this wiki is writable uh, by participants in the group and readable by anybody. Uh, and then. Uh, W3C also has a long uh, history of using IRC, which is uh, Internet Relay Chat, for uh, live conversations. So I'm going to show um, a particular uh, IRC client 
I'm using XChat, Aqua. Uh, there are lots of IRC clients available, and we also have a web interface uh, for W3C's IRC server as well. Um, the infrastructure page shows how to connect to, to IRC, and um, we one reason we continue to use IRC is we've developed a number of IRC robots or bots that help us uh, manage meetings. So um, if I uh, show you quickly, I'm going to say hi to Sean, who's also on the call. Uh, Sean may say hi, Ian. Okay. So uh, suppose that we're in a meeting. I'll give you a quick a quick uh, demo of how we might use IRC to support a meeting. Uh, there are tools for uh, managing an agenda, tools for making minutes, uh, and there's more. There are more tools available for helping a group um, maintain an issues list. That tool called Tracker is not available by default, but it is available to anyone who wants it. I won't demonstrate it during this call, but it's a it's a nifty way to tie together meeting conversations and issue tracking and your mailing list because it can track discussions uh, going on in the mailing list related to a given issue or an action item. Uh, so maybe we'll do that one on another another call. Um, the other the other bot that we have that's very useful in general uh, is connected to our teleconference bridge system that. That bot is called Zakum, and um, community groups currently don't have access to our teleconference bridge resource. Uh, maybe that will change over time, but Zakum is very good at uh, uh, keep knowing who's on the phone, helping you uh, track the, who, who's participating in the meeting, and, and so on. So, um, but Zakum also does a couple of other things. So, for example, if I am in a meeting and we're having a discussion, I can say. Uh, Here's an agenda, how to use Zakum, and uh, the uh, Zakum will keep track of the agenda, and later if I ask uh, which items are on the agenda, I can, I can review that. Um, and then when it's time to discuss that, uh, take up item one, uh, Zakum will help me uh, start the discussion, and uh, I can put myself on the queue to say, Here's the guide. Um, Sean might put himself on the queue as well and ask a question, and then I can use Zakum to sort of manage the queue. So this is really helpful. Um, people can avoid speaking over each other by uh, having the chair watch the IRC channel. Uh, so I can acknowledge myself and say, oh, there's a there's a guidebook URL that explains all of the Zakum commands, and I'll put it in the minutes in a moment, and then. Um, Sean, you wanted to say something about IRC, and you can see now that the queue is empty. So th this is just one quick quick demo of, of one of the meeting management tools available. Um, our RS agent uh, uh, is, um, let me just do one other thing here, agenda plus uh, next meeting, and I'll say Zakum, take up next item, and then we say next meeting, you know, resolved, is going to be 1 March. Okay. So now the meeting's over, and it's time to build the minutes. Um, set logs public. And this tool now will generate on our website uh, a cleaned up view of the minutes. So it just takes a second for the public flag to be available. That's what the this message is telling us. So there's a mirroring issue here. Set logs public. Yeah, it should be available in just a moment. Um, but uh, let's see. Sorry, we'll try to kick it. Kick it. No permissions set. World readable. All right, I'll look into that. But uh, the chair should be able to, or anyone should be able to, from the IRC channel, uh, make the minutes public, and then uh, the sort of clean, semi cleaned up minutes look like this. It it showed you. Uh, uh, let's see, agent, make minutes, let's see if we get an updated uh, table of contents. I was expecting the table of contents to show up. Uh, it's not being highlighted for some reason. I will look into that. But um, the, the cleaned up minutes should should do a nice presentation of, of the meeting, of the action items that were assigned, and so forth. So uh, there's more documentation linked from the infrastructure page about using these tools and, and tracker. Um, we 
have uh, for you know many many years used these to successfully manage meetings and, and uh, keep track of of action items and issues and so on. So let me pause there and see uh, where's my page. See if uh, anyone has any questions. Any questions? Looking at the queue, no hands are up. Okay. So, so just as far as tracker goes, it if you mentioned if you had the system and you mentioned a work item number in the mailing list, it would say in the tracker system that it was mentioned here. If yes. You so in the um, RSS meet or in the IRC meeting, it would say in the tracker it was mentioned here. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. So. Uh, each issue, when you use Tracker, uh, let's go to the W3C homepage, and I can show you. <clears throat> if I go to Tracker here, just this is one quick way to find it. Um, if you, uh, let's see, Tracker examples, let's find one. Web APIs for fun. So this is just to pick a random one. Um, it shows you that uh, all of the people in the group and uh, they're using it to manage issues that people raise against the specification. So, for example, uh, they have uh, given each uh, issue, uh, th there's a sort of number associated with it, and they have a title for it. And if you look at the issue, you can see uh, there's this tracking of uh, email discussions on their mailing list. Uh, that happens automatically uh, by including this string issue 23 in the mailing message, in the email message. Um, so that gives you auto tracking of, of the discussion threads. And then on IRC, if you refer to uh, the issue, it also keeps track of that discussion here. And uh, you can sort of, uh, if Tracker were here, you would say something like Tracker close, uh, you know, issue one, and it would essentially go into the database and close issue one and, and keep a record of what meeting, uh, you know, at what meeting it was closed and so forth. So um, there are also action items. Um, you can assign actions to people uh, with uh, due dates and so on and change the due dates and so forth from within IRC. So there, there's tight integration via tracker uh, between the mailing list and uh, the issues and actions database and the IRC channel. Uh, so that that covers a little bit uh, the blog that is available uh, to groups. Well, actually, I didn't. The, the, the blog is used. Let's go to a group that's been around for a while. Um, let's pick uh, ODRL. I think their their homepage. So if we go to their homepage, we see that uh, you know they have they're using their blog to communicate internally. They're announcing events, publications, and so on. And um, the way that they do this is uh, via WordPress. So uh, if you're a participant in the group, you go to uh, the WordPress, add a new post page, enter your title. Now, I, I'm not in the group, but I have privileges by being on the WCC staff, so I can show you what it would look like if you were in the group. But uh, again, the blog is reserved to those who have signed up to be in the group. Um, and then. Uh, there are a number of other tools available within uh, WordPress to uh, to uh, do polling. Uh, like if you if you want to take a vote within your group uh, on a particular proposal, there are polls available in WordPress. Uh, there are ways to um, uh, show events. So I think we have. Uh, uh, if I go here, this is information about a previous workshop, there's a calendar that shows up for future events on on the site. Um, you can categorize posts. And so anyway, this is this is just one way that the group has to, to communicate. Uh, I believe we've set it up also so that blog posts are automatically mailed to the group's public mailing list. Uh, and um, I think there are probably more features available in WordPress than I remember right this second. Uh, so there's one other thing I wanted to just show quickly. You can see in this group, for example, Renato Ianella is the chair of the ODRL community group. Um, the way that uh, this is documented in the infrastructure page, but the way the chairs are chosen, you can sort of see. It, I have a, again a sort of privileged view, but uh, this is what you would see 
in a group with no chair. Uh, so if you had joined a group and there were no chair in the group, you would see a checkbox next to uh, each individual, and then you uh, you could just check the person you want to be the chair and uh, uh, send the form in, and uh, that person then shows up as being in the chair. Once there is a chair who's been appointed, or more than one chair, um, only the chair or chairs can then change the chairs uh, so they can sort of, uh, you know, remove themselves as chair, uh, at which point the system goes back to the initial state and people can choose their chairs again. So th there's no particular algorithm for choosing a chair uh, within a group that, that's left to the group to decide. Um, in some cases, um, the people who uh, propose a group to begin with expect to be the chairs and, and they sort of, you know, set up the group and then immediately appoint themselves and uh, they are welcome to do that. So that's just a quick. We, we are looking in general to set up the infrastructure so that the groups can do as much as possible uh, on their own, uh, blogging and nominating their chairs and using their wiki and uh, announcing, uh, you know, publications. Um, there's a little bit that the staff is still uh, in the loop for, but uh, over time, over this year, we 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 are trying to get ourselves out of the loop as much as possible. Um, one thing I have not said, said, much, said much about is uh, uh, group publishing of reports. So the contributor agreement is essentially the agreement you sign for the specifications that a group will produce. Um, and we call these community group reports. And uh, we do not have this in place yet. I'm expecting it to be completed this week. Um, there will be a little bit of interface for a group to register that they have published a new report. And then we will list on this reports page um, the aggregation of all the various community group reports, and on a given group's uh, home page, uh, uh, right at the uh, top here, uh, before the news, there will be a little section that talks about uh, anything that the group has already announced as a publication. So uh, it will, they will automatically show up here. And then uh, when the group issues a final a call for final specification commitments, there'll be an interface for making those commitments. So let me pause there and see if anybody has any questions. I've sort of covered what I wanted to cover today, but uh, there may be lots of questions. Or none. Well, so I'll ask uh, a couple questions while the others uh, come up with their own. Did, um, so the report the report section, people would use that when they do want to do a final specification? So um, there's sort of two times uh, people will want to uh, announce a publication. So suppose you're the uh, you know accessible infographics group and you're a chair of the group. So chairs, chairs will see right here on their screen of, uh, in, for their group um, a button or its equivalent that says, uh, you know, publish a new document, and if it's a draft, uh, they'll provide the title and the URL to the document, and they'll push a button, and we'll automatically announce in the system uh, the accessible infographics community group has published a new draft. Here's the URL to the document. Here's its title, and it will show up uh, in a news item on the group's page. It will show up on the system uh, aggregation of news for a little while. Uh, it will be listed on the reports page as a draft, this reports page. It will show up on the groups page as a draft, and it will sit there uh, as, and, until such time as the group says, okay, now we're done, and we're going to move that document to the final stage. And there will be another form for the chair to fill out that says, we're moving that document to final stage. And when the chair does that, we'll issue another announcement that says uh, that's an invitation to, to group participants to sign the final spec agreement. And uh, we will have a page listing those uh, those commitments and a form available for people to make those commitments. And again, all, all of the draft and final documents produced by the group will be, will be listed here. So all of the, that's essentially the bits we're finalizing this week, these forms and the and, and the display of uh, information about reports. Okay, that actually leads into my next question. Other than than publishing a report, what what responsibilities or rules do chairs have? So uh, let's go to the documentation for that. Uh, it's a good question to see. If, I don't know if it's in the FAC. Uh, let me check here while we're here. Uh, what are the roles and responsibilities of a chair? I'm sort of looking chair. I don't see anything there, at least with type ahead. Uh, let's go to the process uh, chair. So it says the chair determines the 
by which the group adopts and modifies its internal agreements. Uh, the chair announces to the group any changes to the agreements under which they agree to participate. So these are the sort of operational ones like um, how often they're going to meet, their deci decision-making policies, things that are sort of below the, uh, the level covered by the global uh, process here. Um, chairs are responsible for ensuring the group fulfills the requirements of this document. So they, they basically need to make sure that the group is, uh, you know, following the overall rules. Uh, and then chairs uh, get to publish. And uh, I think that's more or less it. So the, there's a little bit here about chair needing to ensure that meet, if a group chooses to meet, and they're not required to, uh, like a face-to-face -face meeting, that um, uh, that there is an agenda that's sent out in advance that meeting minutes are, are published and so forth. So there are a few rules described in this process, but um, you know, in some sense the chair is responsible for making sure the group functions and, and follows the process. Uh, the, we, we have some documentation that's coming along um, that uh, we haven't uh, we haven't finalized yet. We have a, a, a group that is itself a community group called the Community Council, and uh, this group has begun to work on uh, some documentation uh, to help people run groups. So, uh, for example, there's a page here how to how to start a community or business group. And what we would like to do is in in the uh, for example in the announcement, uh, hey, there's a new group that's that exist and you can come join it, we would include a link to, to this documentation. But we haven't fully integrated it into the, the site in the way that the other documentation uh, is there. So we're getting close. You can see you know, how, to, how your home page works and how you, how you use the blog, how you run a group, so how you run meetings, issue tracking, decisions, community management. So, so there, there will be other sort of documentation for chairs on how to run a group in practice. Um, and we're also uh, looking at doing some redesign to the site, actually to make uh, some of the documentation uh, unnecessary because the user interface will be uh, so clear. So, so this is part of our uh, ongoing work to make to make uh, you know the environment uh, one where people can collaborate uh, easily and where chairs know what they're supposed to do. And um, there is uh, another function of this community council is. Uh, beyond sort of making sure that the program as a whole functions well is to, to help groups make progress. So uh, if, if a group is sort of stuck, they can uh, reach out to this community council and seek help, uh, or the W3C staff is around to, to help groups continue to make progress and resolve issues, help groups uh, find other groups that may be doing related work and so on. Great. Thank you, Ian. I am. <laughs> As uh, I don't see any other questions at this point, I, I think we should close this off. I found that to be a very educational and uh, um, well-presented tutorial and tour of the different tools that are available at, uh, for W3C community groups. And uh, on behalf of the whole OSLC community, I would like to thank you for taking the time to share this information with us and uh, allow us to record it. And as I said at the beginning, we will take this recording and post it on the uh, uh, OSLC YouTube page. And, uh, I, and I hope that some of the other community groups or people who are interested in participating in community groups may then be able to access that uh, video and uh, get some benefit from it too. I hope so too. I thank you for this opportunity. Uh, do send me the URL, and I will, uh, you know, announce it on the the main blog of the system, uh, so that it shows up in the news and and, and uh, link to it from the documentation, so people have the opportunity to to uh, to hear the questions and 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 see the tools in action. Excellent. Well, that concludes this call. If you are interested in other OSLC uh, webcasts, there is in fact another one happening this Thursday. And if you go to the open-services.net blog, you'll be able to see it. It's using OSLC in the context of strategic planning for IT. That one should also be recorded, so if you happen to miss it, 
you will be able to find another recording on YouTube. And uh, there's also a page on open-services.net where you can sign up to be notified of upcoming presentations. And I will put that in the, when we put, publish on YouTube, we will be sure to put that in the information section so that you can find the link right there. Thank you again, Ian, and I'm now going to steal presentation back from you and stop the recording. Sure. I have one, one last comment, if I may. In our FAQ, there's a link to a slide set that I put together uh, that people can also uh, consult. It gives a similar overview, maybe a little, uh, with a little bit more detail, and so you can sort of follow along in text with a, 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 a more cautious uh, or more careful thoughtful description of the contributor policy and, and so on. So uh, there is a slide presentation, uh, a, uh, an online you know, web slide presentation available. Okay. We'll, we'll be sure to put that link as well and maybe any others that you uh, want to add in the, in the information section of the video. And I, I do see we did get one last question. If there are more questions that come later, what's the right place to put that? Uh, certainly we'll have a forum open uh, forum section open at open-services.net, so you could post any questions there. Ian, is there any other way that if people have questions, they should go ahead and ask? Sure. So uh, this link uh, on the community group homepage uh, for questions and bugs uh, will basically prompt you to send an email to our public mailing list, and, and uh, which I monitor and I'm happy to answer questions.